Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone, um, and uh, thank you for uh, for joining us in this webinar. So uh, what we have lined up this afternoon is um, a um, sort of a quick run through, a quick explanation of what the Support Center for Data Sharing is doing around model contract terms um, uh, as a, a uh, non-regulatory way to facilitate and to enable um, data sharing in general, particularly focusing on some critical uh, sectors some critical industries that have also been targeted in the uh, European data strategy that I guess most of you will be um, familiar with. Uh, basically what I want to do in uh, this session is explain sort of what the, the, the policy context and policy relevance um, is, not of data sharing in general because I assume most of you are, are very familiar with that, but also specifically what the role is uh, of uh, model contract terms and then a little bit more specifically to give you a, a look at what we are doing uh, as a support center for data sharing and um, uh, how that might help and how it might be useful. So I'll start off um, probably around uh, a 15 minute introduction on just the general uh, policy background and um, a, a quick overview of the uh, legal topics where um, model contract terms can be useful. This is basically a, a, an overview of um, elements in contractual terms that um, affect uh, the way data can be shared or the extent to which you can uh, can rely on them. So we've been, do been doing some analysis on that um, particular topic and then going a little bit more in detail as to what we're doing within uh, the support center itself and how some of the um, tools that we're providing within the support center um, might be useful uh, to you as well in uh, in your own um, activities. And indeed, in the end, we'll have a Q&A where you can raise uh, any sort of additional questions uh, that um, that you might have after this presentation or to make suggestions on what you would like to see happening. Um, that's also an important um, objective of this particular webinar for us is first of all to show you um, what we've been doing and what the output is and, and what you might be able to take from us, so to speak. But secondly, also um, it always helps us to get feedback on um, what your uh, additional expectations or requirements might be and how this could be made uh, more useful. We'll give our own uh, opinions on that as well, our own um, plans also and our, our ambitions for uh, for this kind of work. Um, but obviously, you know, if we can get some um, additional uh, feedback from our stakeholders, from the participants in this webinar on, on what they might like to see happening, that only helps us uh, ensure that the work is more, uh, more useful for you. Maybe to start off with um, the uh, the quick initial introduction. So um, what is the, the context in which we're doing this work? I already mentioned I'm not going to talk too much about um, uh, about the, the general policy context behind uh, data sharing, but the support center for data sharing, just to quickly introduce the work for those who are less familiar with it, and specifically um, to collect and disseminate knowledge and best practices um, on, on uh, well, best practices on technologies and cultural elements, legal frameworks that affect um, data sharing, basically uh, exploring the role that data has in uh, today's information economy and the digital economy, and to make sure that data sharing can happen um, more easily. This is a support project in the, the truest sense of the word, in the sense that there's no um, element of, uh, of uh, coercion in there saying you must do this or you should do it this way or you're doing it wrong. It's really a tool that's made available uh, towards organizations that um, have data that they would like to share and we you know, are curious on, on how to do that from a practical perspective, organizationally, technically, legally. Um, but also to look uh, at organizations who would like to use data themselves and who are curious, you know, is, is this going to be accessible to me? Uh, and is this going to be, um, uh, something that I can reasonably rely on. Can I work with the data that I will be receiving? Um, we are not uh, an, an, an ideological network in the sense we're not purely focusing on uh, open data, unconstrained data in, in, in the sense of data being you know, essentially thrown on the internet and made available free for all. That's nice. That's definitely also uh, data sharing, but we don't limit um, limit ourselves uh, to that. The, the goal is not to make sure that uh, all data is there for everybody, but to look specific at uh, cases where uh, benefit can be gained. And specifically, there's a win-win result on both sides, both on the data sharing party and the data receiving party. So um, the, case, the core focus of the work for the Support Center for Data Sharing in general is to look at situations where it's beneficial on all sides for data to be shared and then help um, 
people uh, make that a reality to find the right technologies, to find the, the right procedures to do that. And you know, I'm uh, part of the legal team of the support center for uh, for data sharing to um, find the appropriate legal scoping. If, you know, data can be made uh, available for anyone for any particular purpose without any kind of constraints, then so much the better. Um, but uh, that's not the, the uh, core objective. The core objective is to find the right data sharing modalities, um, not to uh, take all of take away all of the breaks and uh, hope that um, that good things will happen. Having said that, it is a very uh, open um, scoped project as well, looking at all kinds of potential sectors, all kinds of business cases, all kinds of data and for any type of user. So it is a, a, a very um, uh, broad uh, initiative. It's um, generally the, the work that we're doing um, for the support center and particularly also for model contract terms um, takes place against the general background of the European data strategy. So in the European Union, there is um, the uh, conviction as backed up by evidence as well that uh, increased data sharing is generally beneficial um, for the economy, for innovation in general, but also for European citizens, businesses and public administrations. Uh, data sharing is seen as something that needs to be encouraged, especially um, within uh, specific industries as a way of uh, enabling and facilitating uh, innovation, um, allowing new um, services and new products to be created and improving general um, uh, efficiency and, and, and productivity. Um, a particular area of concern, not the exclusive area of concern, is the role of um, smaller companies, of SMEs, um, who have less negotiating power. Uh, that's a, 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 a sort of a risk, a general uh, concern that we have in the uh, data economy today. Um, in uh, a lot of areas and a lot of uh, business situations, we're looking at um, winner take all kind of markets where you have very dominant players who can afford to um, uh, hoard their data and uh, dictate uh, unilaterally the terms under which data is made available. And inversely, we can say, you know, if you're buying my products or my services, I'm going to be taking your data and I'm going to use it for these and these and these purposes without necessarily giving much negotiation power or giving a lot of influence um, to SMEs. That's a particular concern within the European Union, which is very much an SME uh, driven market in general. And this is why uh, the European policy is basically to take measures that facilitate life a little bit for SMEs, make it easier for them to get access to data and make it easier for them uh, to use that data, including for new innovations, new services, uh, new products so that they can grow on their own or uh, find new uh, synergies. The contractual terms, and that brings us to the work that we're doing right now. Contractual terms are obviously a big part of that. Um, and in addition to um, making sure that just data is technically available to you, um, that you're able to get to it, that you can download it, or that there is an interface, a web service, or an API that you can use to get data. You also need to make sure that the uh, terms of use of that particular data um, uh, allow you to actually innovate, allow you to benefit from that data. The, the, the general position is that it should be possible uh, for data to be accessed and used at a reasonable price under fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory uh, terms, uh, which are transparently available to everybody so that it's possible, um, particularly for SMEs, but the concerns obviously broader, SMEs are just more vulnerable, so that it's possible um, for everybody to compete on fair and open terms and that you don't um, accidentally establish or incentivize or enable or encourage data monopolization uh, in a way that's detrimental for society and for the economy uh, as a whole. And the importance of contracts in that ecosystem as the main uh, way right now of scoping um, which data is available and, and under which constraints, the role of contracts there is obviously critical. This is all the more so because you know, the, the uh, one answer to that might be well, why don't you just legislate? Why don't you just say this data must be made available under these and these and these terms? Um, that would also have been an option, but the main challenge there obviously is, well, first of all, this isn't a, a, a uh, one size fits all type problem where a one kind of legislative approach would be suitable for all possible um, industries. But secondly, also, uh, it's very difficult to um, scope exactly what is fair, what is reasonable, and what is non-discriminatory, especially because uh, the data economy is moving so quickly and the role of data in the information society in general is moving so quickly. So it's very difficult to stipulate exactly from a regulatory perspective to just say uh, it's legally required to do it this way. And that's why um, data sharing uh, approaches so far are very much 
policy perspective, focusing on voluntary data sharing and incentivizing um, parties to engage in win-win relationships where uh, it's beneficial on both sides to make data available, um, to share it and to allow it to be uh, reused. And uh, the European data strategy, you see that reflected in the concept of data spaces, which also identify sort of the strategic policy areas that the European Union wants to focus on, where it says these are the areas where in particular um, it would be beneficial to see increased um, data sharing and better data sharing uh, practices under fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory terms. I've, I've listed them here, so industrial manufacturing, green deal, mobility, health, finance, energy, agriculture, and public administration, all of which are sectors that are increasingly being uh, data driven and where there is a risk that um, major players are able to capture um, a significant, a too significant part of the market simply by holding data hostage and by making sure that no innovation can happen without their blessing, without their support and without their own um, financial gain, which would be um, suboptimal obviously for uh, society as a whole and for innovation in particular. Model contract terms are uh, considered as a, a, a one of the softest way to intervene in the market um, as something that can be uh, promoted, published as a free to use as an optional uh, tool. Um, model contract terms basically give you a menu uh, as a, either as a data sharing party uh, or as a data receiving party, give you a, a menu that you can select from and to say, well, uh, let's look at uh, the exact issue that I have and let's see what kind of um, contractual constraints uh, might be reasonable to impose or to accept on both sides of the market. It's useful because it gives you some easy uh, and, and immediately practically um, available support. If you need to have a contract, if you need to write a contract or you need to assess a contract that is being offered to you, then model contract terms can help you assess quickly whether this is reasonable and what you need to look out for. And secondly, obviously, the publication of model contract terms is also an incentive and encouragement to the market, basically saying, well, this seems to be based on our experiences and based on what we've seen in the market right now. These seem to be terms that should be most conducive to both sides of the relationship winning. This is considered to be reasonable and even though you're not legally required to use these model contract terms uh, they should um, uh, help you uh, in the short run um, they're easily consumable they're easy to integrate in your uh, existing business cases um, you are still free to modify them so it's not a, a, a take it or leave it approach it's not mandatory to use them um, and you can tailor them uh, to your own specific uh, situation so model contract terms generally uh, pretty important what are sort of the key topics that you need to look out for when uh, looking at contract terms is the the uh, the central idea for the support center for data sharing would be to come up with uh, contractual terms that uh, make the vision that i just discussed a reality that allow you to share uh, data in specific sectors in a way that's mutually beneficial um, what are the different topics that you often not always but in many contracts that are relevant this is an overview that's based on uh, the contracts that we've analyzed, of which there are slightly over 100 right now. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that later on. Um, basically, the, the main things to look out for in uh, contract terms related to data sharing or that involve data sharing um, are the scoping of the data, modalities of sharing, usage restrictions, restrictions on onwards dissemination, remuneration compensation, liability in relation to the data, and determination uh, conditions and consequences. Um, I won't go over all of those in detail because that would be a little bit uh, prohibitive in terms of timing, but I think the importance for most of that is, is pretty clear. Um, scoping is important to be able to understand on both sides what exactly is the data that will be sent. Uh, you might think that's going to be very intuitive just looking at the service, but we shouldn't forget that data sharing services are also often hidden. They're under the hood. Uh, if you have a smart device uh, or smart equipment, smart machinery, data sharing is automatically happening. If you have your smartphone lying next to you, which 99% chance you do, that is a smart device exchanging data right now. In a context where you're engaged in, uh, especially in business to business um, data sharing and where the idea is that there's mutual benefit, it's important at the very least that both sides know exactly what they are sharing. Same thing with the modalities. How is this going to happen? Is this going to is your device going to be sharing uh, data automatically? Do you periodically upload data? Uh, is there a web service that can be used to to, to make data available? Uh, having a contractual constraint around that can be very important. Restrictions on usage, including onwards dissemination, obviously are, are very important. 
uh, when you are sharing a data, what is the recipient going to be doing with that? Is it just to be able to provide a service to you or to make sure that your product works? Um, are they going to be analyzing your behavior? Uh, and if so, is that for your own benefit? Or are they going to be making recommendations to you? Or is that to improve their service offering in general, maybe to build something new? The worst case scenario is your data is simply going to be sold. Um, it will be used to improve security. Scientific research is going to be shared with other parties. Um, it's important to have those contractual uh, constraints, to have that clarified at least. Uh, there's nothing that's intrinsically unacceptable in all cases, but it's important uh, to know where the vulnerabilities are and uh, what you need to look out for. Remuneration is important. Are you getting anything in exchange of your data? And is it opt in or opt out? Is it, you know, do, you have, do I get any kind of say in which data is um, being shared in practice or is it is it all or nothing? It's just, you know, you, you buy a smart uh, tractor or you buy uh, solar panels and your data automatically gets shared uh, with uh, with somebody else. The kind of options that you have there and whether you get anything in return are important. Uh, liability as well. What happens when things go wrong? Uh, and uh, is there a distinction there between a service or a product in general malfunctioning or data that you've sent or that you've received being defective in the sense that it's uh, inaccurate or has been corrupted or not sufficiently qualitative. That's an important topic too. And then finally, termination conditions and consequences. What happens when you pull the plug, when you decide I no longer want your product, I no longer want your service, I want to um, unsubscribe from whatever it is that you're offering. Is your data destroyed or do you get it back? What is the arrangement that's uh, in place there? So those are the different topics that we wanted to look at. Um, what do we actually do? What do we actually, have we actually done with the support center? First of all, very briefly, uh, one thing that you can get from the, the uh, support center, which we we'll always put on the table because it's generally important, there is a legal help desk in the um, uh, support center for data sharing. So if you have any kind of legal issues that you want help with, contractual terms or data sharing practices in general, um, there is a contact form that you can use to ask specific targeted questions. That's general, it's not linked to the um, model clauses for data sharing, but it is an important one because it's the part of uh, our support services that can be tailored. That's basically available uh, upon request to you. But then specifically for uh, recommended contract terms, contract clauses, what are we doing there? Well, uh, we've been working on a uh, report on recommended uh, contract terms that um, are a little bit uh, more targeted specifically towards the contractual uh, context. You might not have an issue that requires intervention of the help desk. You might just be looking for actual templates that you can reuse in your own contracts or that you can use as a yardstick to determine whether your uh, own contracts, the contracts being offered to you, um, are acceptable from a qualitative perspective. You know, obviously you could just try to find something from the internet, but then you don't know whether it's really suitable or whether it's fair, whether it's balanced, whether it's tailored to the European context. So that's the gap that we wanted to fill. And to do that, we've come up with a report on model uh, contract terms that looks at um, how data sharing contracts are dealt with in practice across a series of uh, crucial sectors, basically aligned with the European um, data strategy. Uh, and looking at you know where those European data spaces are expected to emerge and where uh, problems have to be um, filled. So what we've done there is uh, done a, a pretty thorough study of um, existing contracts, uh, real life contracts. It's not theoretical stuff that we've dreamt up or just uh, you know fantasized about what might be happening, but where we looked at actual um, terms and conditions. Uh, under various terms, you know, uh, it's service agreements, terms and conditions, licensing agreements, whatever the the label is that's put on the uh, the contract, um, where we've looked at real life clauses on all of those different topics that I just mentioned, and look at how the scoping actually um, is done, what kind of provisions you can find in practice on scoping of data, on liability, onwards dissemination, uh, and so forth. So we've looked at six uh, particular sectors. I'll highlight light that in a little bit more detail later on. And in each case, um, what we've done is not just, you know, copy pasted the contracts, uh, contractual clauses, because that would not be useful, but also in each case to identify you know, what is difficult in this sector. What makes agriculture unique? Why is finance uh, particularly sensitive? Um, what is the role of data in industrial manufacturing? Sort of explaining, first of all, the importance of data, but secondly, also looking at the, uh, the general policy context, whether it's uh, how it's affected specifically by the European data strategy and whether is, there is legislation in place that forces or coerces or forbids in some cases 
uh, certain types of data sharing. So, you know, we want to provide some contextual background, then uh, an analysis of contractual terms and um, an analysis of whether those are fair balanced or not, what the benefits are, the, the advantages and the downsides of each of the uh, clauses that we've looked at. So what you wind up then is a pretty extensive repository of, well, it's slightly over 100 agreements uh, looking at eight different topics. Um, so it'll be, it won't be exactly 800 clauses that are in, uh, in, our, uh, in our report, um, since not uh, every particular contract covers every particular topic, but should be somewhere around 500 clauses uh, that are addressed in that report um, itself. Um, uh, what does that look like? I've called it a preview here because it's not published online yet. It will be in, uh, in the coming weeks. First of all, a general description of what we look to do, and then an analysis of six specific um, sectors. So we looked at agriculture, um, smart mobility, energy, financial services, green deal, and industrial manufacturing. We've also tried to take um, sort of cast a wide net, making sure that we have different uh, uh, types of services and different types of products for each of those sectors. So, um, now for instance, for the energy sector, it's not just um, six contracts that relate to uh, an, an analytics platform for your solar panels. We have that covered as well, but that's not the only thing there. For financial services, it's not only an app that allows you to um, get uh, account information from, from multiple banks. Um, and you know, Green Deal, it's not about um, you know, just contracts analyzing uh, meteorological conditions and so forth. We try to cast the wide net and give multiple types of uh, products and services for each uh, of the sectors that we looked at to make sure that it's at least slightly representative. You're never going to cover everything, but at least we want to make sure that we've covered um, as much as possible. The report that we've worked on uh, and that's, uh, that will be published in the coming uh, weeks has both the real life clauses and model clauses. So the real life clauses are marked in blue. Those are the ones taken from actual agreements. We have anonymized them because the goal is not to, to name and shame specific organizations, but to provide model text. So you won't find the names of the companies or of the products and services in there, but the rest of the clauses have not been edited. Uh, they've been copied um, as is. And separately from that, we've also provided model clauses that we've drafted ourselves, often starting on the basis of real life clauses, um, but that have been tweaked in a way that strikes us as being you know, in line with European policies and that strike us as being a little bit more uh, balanced. We also mark in, in the contract clauses whether the um, agreements relate to um, free services, unremunerated services, or paid services, um, simply because in many cases the, the uh, contractual terms relate to a free data service, and that affects obviously also guarantees that you get in terms of quality and liability and so forth. So uh, we've cast the wide net, looked at a lot of uh, use cases. We try to identify policy expectation and points of attention as well and uh, related industry actions too, because we're not the only ones who are looking at um, the, the role and the importance of um, contracts and, and, and shaping and affecting data sharing. Um, you know, for instance, in the agricultural industry, you have um, the work from Copa Kajika, which tries to uh, provide their own model clauses for uh, data sharing and agriculture, uh, that, that's important. Um, you have Orgalim in uh, industrial manufacturing as an industry association providing their own guidelines on what they think is critical in terms of data sharing. Those have been taken into account as well also in drafting the model clauses so that it's uh, uh, as well in tune as you can uh, with um, sort of sector specific uh, concerns. What does that look like? Um, I, obviously, I can't go over 500 clauses uh, during this session, but just to give you an idea of, of what will be in that report and what that looks like. So uh, here, um, I actually, that's the example that I mentioned earlier on, uh, copied a, a uh, real life clause, an actual contractual term uh, from a service agreement um, relating to the remote management of photovoltaic installations. So basically, if you have solar panels on the roof, um, that's likely nowadays that the performance of your solar panels is measured automatically and that it's reported to a third party who has a monitoring system, a platform that you can access also uh, through the internet uh, to see how your uh, solar panels are doing, which is important, for instance, to be able to do um, predictive maintenance, to be able to identify whether your solar panels are performing as might have been expected, you know, taking into account 
the weather and the placement and the performance of, of other uh, systems in your neighborhood. Um, this is a clause that describes um, the uh, intended use of uh, that data. So it, it uh, indicates a little bit how the information from your photovoltaic system uh, will work. We also we cross reference these because you know here you see a reference um, to uh, digital platforms. If there is a definition of a digital platform, that's explained elsewhere in the report so that you can interlink those. So here they say, you know, um, what kind of information uh, will be shared. Um, you, uh, they will get that data directly from you or from your system or from third party monitoring systems. There's a description there about what kind of information uh, is covered and then uh, also a description of who it might be sh shared with. Uh, so your data could be shared with third parties for monitoring reporting uh, services. There's a listing of the kind of companies. And then there's also a statement saying that we may also provide or sell data in aggregated form uh, to third parties who are not connected to the monitoring systems. So basically, there is a clause in there that allows uh, data uh, to be sold in aggregate form, which is not necessarily um, a, a deal breaker, but it is something to look out for because this is um, well, without going into too much detail, data in aggregate form can be um, sufficient to um, to harm your interests. In particular, if uh, you know you have a large number of voltaic, photovoltaic installations and you can measure uh, production and consumption trends, that can be used for uh, energy pricing speculation. Uh, it's not something that, well, I'd say I there are no known, at least I don't know of any cases where that actually happens in practice. In agriculture, it has been known to happen that this kind of aggregate statistical information can be used for pricing speculation, which means that your data is actually going to be used in a way that's directly harmful to you. You, know, you give somebody else your data and they use it in a way that negatively affects uh, your um, interests. So uh, in each case, we also for the real life clauses, we include a quick assessment of advantages and disadvantages. In this case, the language is pretty clear. It's pretty understandable. Um, I think, you know, if you would be interested in reading it, which probably not too many people are, but if you're interested in reading it, if you read through the clause, uh, then you can actually understand more or less what will be happening. Um, so th that part, it's, it's, it's pretty well written. Uh, on the other hand, it is uh, very generic. It also includes uh, exemplative language, which you don't like very much. Uh, for instance, in the description of your data, it says that data that's shared may include, for example, followed by a listing and then indicating that it may be shared followed by a listing. It really doesn't give you much certainty on what is actually happening. To some extent, that's inevitable because you, know, you need some flexibility. You don't want to amend your contracts every time a, a minor detail changes, but it doesn't mean that you don't have a lot of certainty in this particular case of um, uh, what actually happens when you use this kind of uh, system. And the same thing here, you know, the, the uh, usage and sharing rights um, are pretty broad, uh, pretty unconstrained, and uh, selling data in aggregate form is always a risk, not necessarily an unacceptable risk, but it is something that needs to be managed. We, um, in contrast, so we, I've also wanted to show here very quickly uh, a model clause that we've produced. Um, I've intentionally taken one that's from in a comparable uh, context, so it's decentralized energy management. It's not specific to photovoltaics. Uh, this could also be used, for instance, in battery management systems. Um, which you know, decentralized battery management is, is a bit of a more of a hot topic right now, or even uh, in um, hydro hydroelectrical electrical installations, um, hydrogen power management. Uh, you know, those those kinds of systems could be worked here as well. And in those cases where also where we provide a model clause, we also describe the the context. You know, when might you want to use this kind of uh, clause? Um, and we've come up with a listing here also uh, highlighting which kind of uses are legitimate under this kind of contract. So we've made it more clear here that data can be used to ensure that uh, products and services function correctly and that they can be improved. Um, uh, customization uh, of, of knowledge, so providing you with, with personalized overviews should also be possible, but our clause allows you to opt out of that. So our approach is it's fine to use data. Uh, to give you personalized information, but as a customer, you should get the right to opt out of that if you don't want your data to be examined. We allow the use of aggregate statistical data, and there's an, an, an anti-abuse clause that uh, tries to uh, avoid your data being used in a way that's uh, detrimental or harmful um, for you. So uh, this is sort of the kind of thing that we want to do so that when people, um, for instance, want to share data in the context of uh, smart energy systems or smart mobility, or any of the contexts that we've covered, they can basically use this report 
and uh, uh, basically to find out what's going on in the market, what are you know uh, common kind of contractual approaches. But we'll also take a look at the observations that we've made, you know, things that we like and dislike about particular uh, contracts where you might want to consider, is this right? Is this acceptable for me? And maybe even to look at the model clauses and say, ah, this seems reasonable as a starting point. Uh, we don't work under the pretense that our model clauses are perfect for everyone. Um, I, it's, it's, I can perfectly well understand that people will say, oh, this is this is too constrained. Um, I should be able to create um, aggregate statistical information that can't be linked to an individual user anymore. But once I've done that, I want to be able to do whatever I want with it. Then they have to tailor our clause because our clause doesn't allow you to do whatever you want, even with aggregate statistical data. Um, so it, it doesn't allow you to switch off your brain, so to speak. But uh, in the sectors that we've covered, uh, it does give you a nice starting point, uh, both to identify what's happening, uh, to see you know what you should be worried about, and maybe to get some inspiration uh, for solving that problem. So that's what we've done so far. Um, what are some of the, the interesting things that have come out and what do we want to do with that? So to be very uh, concrete and very tangible about that, what we have right now is one single document, one single report that's somewhere around 200 pages long with contractual uh, clauses. It is neatly organized into specific sub chapters per sector and then in each sub chapter uh, organized per topic, uh, but it's still not extremely user friendly. So we will be uh, working on that a little bit. What we have right now is a very good uh, a data repository, a very good resource that we can use um, to build additional knowledge and additional services on. Uh, still, you know, having looked at all of those, there are some interesting, uh, interesting general conclusions that you can draw. You say, okay, you know, now that you've looked at hundreds and hundreds of data sharing clauses, what are some things that stand out or that might surprise you? Um, well, there's actually a, a couple of points that you see coming back in pretty much every uh, single sector. First of all, the, the flexibility. There's a lot of use of exemplative language. Uh, you know, data will be shared, including this. We will be using data for several purposes, uh, for instance, this and this and this. But there's very few. Uh, the use of, of hard and clear contractual language is pretty rare. That's also normal because this is, you know, an innovation driven uh, sector. So the goal is to make sure that uh, services can evolve and data collection and data use can evolve without having to renegotiate new agreements. But that also means that um, that that flexibility means you have less legal certainty. So that's something in the state of play right now that's very clear. Something that is also pretty clear is that uh, in most of the contracts that we've looked at, um, Basically, you see the, the influence there still of cloud computing. Pretty much every contract focuses very much on data sharing in the context of a specific service and the context of a specific product that you're using. And there's actually surprisingly little references to intellectual property rights or to um, confidentiality of, of uh, your personal data. Um, there's very little talk, much less than I would have expected about who owns the data or who has copyrights to it. Um, occasionally some references to licenses, which imply that there's copyright or, or uh, some other form of, of protection, but references to um, services are certainly a lot more common than uh, to intellectual property rights. There are exceptions to that. It, it depends on the sector. Uh, for instance, in the industrial manufacturing, as you can imagine, there's a lot more concern about intellectual property rights uh, on data being shared. You know, if you have an additive manufacturing service, we have that covered in our, our uh, document as well an additive manufacturing service where people can send you the plans of a particular uh, device or particular tool that they need uh, to be created, then um, it is important for you to know that you continue to own your intellectual property rights. So that's an exception, um, but it is the exception for most of the other sectors. Intellectual property rights are less important in the contracts than you might think. We also saw that in uh, most of the contracts, the usage rights um, for the data receiving party, which tends to be a central service provider, are formulated quite broadly and have relatively few constraints, especially when you look at the use of um, aggregate uh, data, and that there is very little protection for a data sharing party against uh, abuses. Part of that obviously is because there's a bias in our data in the sense that uh, a majority, I think probably around 60, 70% of the contracts that we have are non-negotiated. So those are the terms that are often by a uh, service provider where contracts are negotiated and there's uh, more balance and power between uh, the parties that becomes a little bit different uh, and then uh, there's a lot more pushback on usage rights but then the sample that we see sort of in the uh, in the absence of negotiation power usage rights tend to be particularly broad 
And then uh, a final uh, sort of horizontal observation that we see in uh, the contract clauses is that there is very little in terms of guarantees of data deletion and return once a contract is terminated. So uh, you actually see the, the opposite quite frequently that a contract explicitly says, if you terminate your agreement with us, you can do that at any time. Uh, but we retain the right to uh, use your data uh, that you sent to us uh, during the agreement in exactly the same way um, uh, as we had uh, while the contract was still valid. So getting your data back or even getting the guarantee that your data will be deleted is, is far from the general rule, which is a potential risk as well. Because it means that basically that you're uh, leaking data as you're moving from service provider uh, from one service provider to the next. Um, liability, perhaps unsurprisingly, is also relatively rarely addressed. I mean, obviously you have uh, liability clauses in every single contract, but they almost never um, talk specifically about liability for the data. It's always liability for a product or for a service as a whole, but not for uh, the data. So, uh, I mean, this is actually, this wasn't the core focus of this report to find out these kinds of things, but it is, um, there are sort of uh, high level insights, maybe none too shocking or too surprising, but it is something that we've learned while looking uh, over these very many um, contractual clauses and where we also think, you know, maybe we want to do something with that and, and provide some recommendations or guidelines on, on how to deal uh, with those other than by using our model clauses, of course. Um, so where are we now? So like I mentioned, we have a report, basically a, a document of about 200 pages with all of these clauses and with analyses of the individual sectors, talking about uh, you know attention points and, and patterns and, and policy background. Um, that will go live and be published on the website. Probably, I would expect in you know then somewhere in the next uh, two weeks. We still need the final revisions to go through, um, but it should be uh, possible to go live with that um, relatively quickly. And after that, we plan uh, to continue uh, maintain that to improve upon that, possibly by adding some new clauses or by updating the policy sections, since you know policies around uh, specific sectors and specific data might change, and there might be new legislative intervention. We also uh, plan to do some further data mining on, on insights. Basically, the, the, the short observations that I have on this slide here are just things that stood out um, as we were doing the analysis work, but it was not the main objective of, of the work. So we do uh, hope to be able to look at it a little bit more systematically and to provide some more uh, hard statistics on what you see and don't see in, uh, in the existing uh, terms. I will also want to look at uh, making it easier to share and use this data. Right now, it's one big report covering all of the sectors. Our ambitions are also to include sector specific reports so that you know if you're only interested in financial data, you can just grab that part of the financial data and look at the um, the model clauses there, uh, the real life clauses that we find in the market and the points that you need to uh, look out for. And then finally, another option is to look uh, a little bit better at um, you know, what are the indicators of imbalance? What are the warning signs of a relationship that might favor one side more than the other? Um, which might be useful as well in the context of, of the whole ambition of, of uh, encouraging win-win situations. Um, if the goal is to have win-win situations, it's important to understand exactly when both sides are winning and to know uh, what the red flags are. Some of the points on the slide here are also good input for that, but so far, you know, the, the objective of this, well, the goal of this deliverable is to identify real life clauses and to provide model clauses, but obviously it's, it's an interesting um, source of information to do uh, more interesting and more uh, high impact things with. So we'll be looking um, at that as well over the next coming weeks uh, and months. So that's basically what we've been doing uh, with our model contract terms and what we have planned. So there's there's quite a lot of data available. I think at the very least it will be a, a an excellent resource uh, to mine for people who are uh, interested. In, uh, in examining these uh, this kind of data to look at what's going on in the European data sharing market. Um, it's also good input for future policy actions, but maybe most importantly, because that's what we aim to do, it'll be a useful repository for people for looking for uh, best practices and examples on how to engage in uh, data sharing. That's it, basically what I wanted to share from uh, from my side. So I think I'm more or less on schedule, more or less. Uh, so yeah. Happy to open the floor to any kind of questions or comments or uh, observations. Yeah, for the sake of time, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question or raise your hand. Go ahead, Alex. Yes, hi. So um, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. First of all, it was very informative. Uh, 
obviously I'm sort of burning to get uh, my fingers on the, the the model contract terms that you sort of like uh, currently presented in the report mm -hmm. and said it's still in a revision. Is there is there a chance to get a, a preview of it um, or or you know an, an access to it just to understand? I think technically we need to ask permission from the Commission since until they sign off on it, uh, it's it's their call. Um, yeah. But I think in a probably, uh, you know, we have to ask permission, but I, I'm hopeful that that would be granted. Is it's uh, we're hoping that it gets a lot of visibility because there's really um, the two things. It's first of all, it's it's extremely boring to do <laughs> because it's a, it's a ton of contracts to look at. Sure. But secondly, the results are actually quite valuable. It is really a, a good resource to mine. It's, it's not you know, 100% representative of each individual case in each individual sector. But the global picture you get of data sharing practices right now, it's pretty good. So I think it's, uh, I'm hoping that we can uh, can get, uh, can share that with you uh, more quickly than uh, than the next few weeks even. That would be great. I mean, my, my ambition is basically, uh, because I'm currently putting together some terms uh, uh, for, for specific like uh, uh, data sharing pilots that I'm engaged in. And so I, I'm, I'm looking for what is the right wording <laughs> to put in place, what sort of clauses and, and concerns I need to cover. Um, yeah. So for that, it'll be ideal. I mean, uh, you know, no, you should judge whether it's ideal, but at least if you say, OK, I, I just want to have a lot of terms and I want to look at it and I, I will reflect on it, but it would be good to get a starter if somebody could just you know put something in my hands. It is definitely that. So I think for that particular situation, it'll be very useful. Brilliant. And, and just, just a question, have you looked as well at sort of terms for intermediaries. So, you know, so, so basically not necessarily just between, let's say, terms that are used for, let's say, sharing agreement between provider and consumer, but also terms from intermediaries between, you know, provider intermediary and consumer intermediary. Absolutely, and we, we do have a couple of those because there are some, uh, I remember off the top of my head, I, I, I think I personally did three or four of the sectors, but not all of them. But I remember, for instance, in smart mobility, we had a couple of cases where um, the central service was a platform and where you could enable, and also in agriculture, where you could enable uh, data sharing with additional shareholders, uh, additional stakeholders. So uh, it was basically you had contractual clauses that were also very much tailored to uh, web services and API economies, where basically said, you know, this is what happens by default. And in addition, uh, your interface, uh, our interface will give you the option of unlocking our data through APIs. Actually, we wrote some model clauses for that as well, uh, basically to tailor, um, you know, what is normal. The, that's it's the very fundamental question. If you're using this sort of intermediary platform, the central ecosystem, and the idea is that data will be shared onwards with s other service providers, what is going to be the data sharing that has to happen as a part of that central platform that should be, you know, uh, on by default and maybe even always on, not even an opt-out system. And what are the aspects that you should be able to control as an end user and where you say, I'm okay with this. This one can now receive my data also for this purpose. And what happens when I switch it off? I, I, do I get assurances that my data is deleted then? So um, we have some some real life clauses for that and we drafted model clauses for that uh, as well. So it should be useful for that context too. Thank you. I see a hand up from Elf, go ahead. Hello, I have a very practical question and I would like to put it in the chat, but for one reason or the other, I don't have a chat. So, Mr. Gra, uh, really a big thank you for this presentation. I found it super interesting um, and it's highly relevant for us. So, um, I found it so interesting that I will make huge publicity at the publications office for it. And therefore, I wanted to know, Ramon, the, um, if if it will be published, uh, the recording on on the site with the webinars. Where yes, the recording will be published on YouTube and I will make sure to send you the link in an email. Ah, yes, because I have another site on EDP. OK, thanks. Yes, it will be online shortly. Mm -hmm. I think tomorrow. Yeah. OK. <laughs> Excellent. No, I'm, I'm glad that it's well, at least the first impressions are useful. Um, yeah, like I said, when you, when you see the report when it's published, it is a lot. Um, so we are looking at ways to make it a little bit easier uh, to digest and to uh, to search. The information there, however, it's, 
it's the most extensive resource on this type of, uh, of, of, of inputs that I'm aware of, at least. We don't think that anything like this at this scale has been done, at least not within Europe. So, uh, and also didn't really mention that, but we didn't also limit ourselves purely to European service providers. So it also has um, more global um, relevance as well. So uh, yeah, we, we there's a ton of things that we can do with it. We have some plans ourselves, but we also look forward to what other people will uh, will be doing with it. Can I ask a quick follow up question? Um, I also saw that you did a similar report, I think, in 2019. Is this a new addition or is it very it is, another scope? It is actually different. The work that we did in 2019 uh, is on um, contract terms for APIs. And basically the main difference is, and it's an important one, uh, that one basically we wrote ourselves. So there you can generate a license uh, for an API, but it's entirely model clauses. So it's, it's what we think that needs to look like but it's not based on real life data sharing practices. And I think that's where sort of the unique uh, unique selling point of our current work comes from. It's an overview about what's actually happening and um, uh, rather than just looking at, you know, from a policy perspective, what do we need to happen? So there's a difference in scope because one was, a, the 2019 work was API specific and not all kinds of data sharing. Um, and, and the current work is based on real life clauses as well, also includes model clauses, but the starting point was real life data sharing clauses. So there is, uh, yeah, they're co very well complementary, I think. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. We're going a bit over time, so uh, feel free to leave this call if you have to, but I see there's another uh, question from Jerka. Uh, so um, if, if you don't have to get another meeting to attend to, you can of course stay along and, and we can still address Jerka's question. So go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ray. What I have to say is not uh, really a question. It's more uh, a follow up answer to Alex's question concerning the publication uh, of this uh, report. Uh, I have been just going through it uh, yesterday and today, and uh, I think uh, subject to some really minor comments, we can move on towards the publication very quickly on the support center. Then, of course, we can, uh, as uh, Hans was uh, also reflecting, we, we can then decide how to make it m more uh, palatable, searchable by by uh, sector or by the nature of the clauses. But the, the report as such, uh, as, a, as a chunk of text, uh, will be ready fairly soon. Uh, I think so. The, 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 the raw data, I think, is, is well, I'm sure we'll need some small tweaks, but I think it's more or less ready to be published. And then sort of next steps is now, how can we make this more attractive and more usable? Um, so yeah, we have our, our own plans for that, but uh, if anybody has any particular suggestions of on, on, on how to do that, then uh, yeah, feel free to make them as well, obviously. Uh, we have an, a, a direct interest in making sure that this is all very, uh, uh, as useful as it can be. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hans, for this talk. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, I think for the sake of time, I won't uh, go into uh, questions from our side anymore. Um, but thank you so much uh, for being here and talking about model terms today. Um, the the report will be published shortly, right? Within two weeks. Um, and people can find this on Support Center for Data Sharing. Um, the recording will be on our YouTube. Uh, and I'm posting in the chat right now a full overview of the upcoming and past data talks um, and also the link to the satisfaction survey that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and also we'll make sure to send you an email with the with the recording um, should you not be able to find it on the YouTube. Um, That's very kind and sorry for this. No, no, of course not, not at all. Um, so if nothing else, I would like to close the session off. Thank you once again uh, and we'll be uh, looking out for the report shortly. Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone.